Hello, and welcome everyone. Welcome to AUP's Labor in Motion Movie Club, where we screen the movies your boss doesn't want you to see. And I'm Jordan Thompson. I'll be your host. And just in case you don't know, the film that we're talking about tonight is actually a sequel from a 2004 film called The Corporation. That film is available on YouTube in its entirety. And our first guest tonight is professor of law at the University of British Columbia. He studied at Oxford and Harvard. He is author of several books, including The Corporation, which analyzed the evolution and behavior of modern corporations from a critical perspective. And I know you all join me in wishing a very warm AUP welcome to Joel Bakken. Joel? Thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I come from a, a union family. I uh, was brought up uh, with uh, lots of memories of my grandparents who were uh, organizers and members and activists in uh, the Ladies Garment Workers Union uh, as immigrants in, in New York City. Pleasure to meet you and we're very glad you could join us. I'm equally pleased to introduce tonight's other very special guest, She's a Sundance and Genie award-winning director and writer who specializes in social justice and environmental documentaries. She co-directed and edited the 2004 film based on Joel's book of the same name, The Corporation. She hails from Montreal. She studied political science, women's studies, and deep ecology at McGill. And she dropped out of law and decided instead, after quitting law, to uh, go to the Emily Carr U University of Art and Design. And I know you all join me in wishing a warm welcome to Jennifer Abbott. Jennifer. Oh, well, thank you so much um, for having us. It's a, it's a real honor to be here and to kick off your film series this year. Uh, I can say just with your um, brief comments that you know, you're speaking my language. <laughs> so first question, Joel and Jennifer, I'll let you answer at will, however you wish. How did you feel the need to update the corporation from 2004 into a sequel in 2020. Did you have any personal experiences in the intervening years that led you to feel that a sequel was necessary? I remember exactly where I was and what I felt uh, when uh, the idea for a sequel came up. I was uh, sitting in a theater in downtown Vancouver watching the 10th anniversary screening of the first film sort of hit me like a brick that what are we celebrating here? Every single issue that we dealt with in that film has gotten worse. Climate change, inequality, union busting, it's all worse. And corporations are bigger and corporations are more powerful and they're more of a threat to democracy. And then add to that the fact that by that time, corporations were saying that they were good actors now, that they got the message from the first film and the anti-globalization movements and they'd up their games, they'd become conscientious and they were gonna save the world now. And I thought, this is really messed up. And obviously the first film didn't do the job. Uh, so it's time for another one. And uh, that, that was sort of the, the, the seminal moment for me. I was in the process of making my other film, which is also released now, The Magnitude of All Things. And I sort of heard rumors of uh, the idea of making a sequel. And I was just like, oh my God, no, I, I just do not want to make a sequel. Uh, part of that response could easily, easily have been, um, in addition to co-directing the first film, I also edited it. and. You know, I've been doing this a long time and I can tell you there is really no more monsters of a film than the corporation films. Uh, we cut, you know, I cut that film from 400 hours of footage and the first rough cut was 34 hours and that I think took me a year. So, you know, I, I had quite a bit of resistance. And also, you know, to be quite honest, I. I, I didn't have a lot to say in addition at that moment in time. Absolutely, things were desperately grave. But from my point of view, had the analysis changed that much? No. And so for me, the defining moment was when Trump was elected. And it wasn't as if everything changed suddenly there. And we do see Trump as a symptom as opposed to a cause of all the existential crises we 
currently face. But for me, what happened in that moment was that the veil came down. Um, sort of the, the pretense that government and corporations were independent. And we saw, and, and they had the audacity all of a sudden uh, to rig the system in plain view for their benefit, uh, for anyone who was paying the least bit of attention. So it was that moment that I was like, okay, yeah, time for a sequel now. Thanks for that, Joel and Jennifer. Well, let me ask you my second question. Um, your doc documentary spends a fair amount of time exploring how corporations have gained power over governments to deregulate the economy and increase their profits. The film then pivots towards the end to suggest a solution to this problem. And the solution is that progressive insurgent candidates propelled by social movements need to win more elections. Is it contradictory to suggest that weakened governments can rein in powerful corporations? Yes, in some ways it is. However, that misses the points that in addition, our whole film is oriented towards uh, looking at ways we can strengthen democracy. Because really in many ways, the primary protagonist and antagonist, you know, the primary protagonist of our film is democracy and the antagonist is the corporation. And so, you know, we, we're trying to also explore ways that we can, uh, you know, bolster the strength of government so that it has the kind of power it needs to, to out, you know, to, to be able to match the outsized power of corporations, which is admittedly very difficult given the uh, extraordinary imbalance currently. But I think, you know, there's a very important element and message to our film that goes along with that, which is really looking at the way neoliberalism has very successfully uh, suggested that there's only a minimal role for government. And in the, you know, in the last 40 years, we see uh, this decline in the public's perception of what the government can do in society. And even the aspiration for democracy, you know, we've really, uh, I think, in many circles lost that. We've, we've lost sort of faith in government to actually serve the people. And, and that's a deliberate uh, strategy, of course, on the part of, of neoliberalism in the corporate world. So I think we also really try and explore that so that people can have faith in government again and then commit themselves in every way they can to strengthening. Because yes, I think the point is a good one. Uh, we certainly can't, um, the, the regulations need to have teeth and certainly part of the problem currently is that many don't. Um, the only thing I, I'd add is, is that, of course, corporations are created by governments. They're created by the state. Um, and they're, they're, our, they're our own creation. They're not these things that exist outside. And, you know, within a democracy, they should be subjects of democratic governance rather than partners with governments or, uh, or superiors of governments as, as they become. So I think that what we present in the film is a project. And the project is how do we get to a place where, as Jen put it, democracy is alive enough, is strong enough, uh, is um, uh, accountable and responsible enough uh, that it actually governs economic relations in the public interest. We're nowhere near being there. And we're not going to get there simply by continuing to support sort of governments as usual. And so it's not about saying we just need to elect people. It's about saying we need to have really strong social movements, including a really strong labor movement that works in partnership with democratic institutions, where there's movement through uh, and between uh, the streets and the offices of government, uh, rather than through and between the offices of government and the corporate sector. Um, so, so it is a, it's a challenge and it's a project. It's not saying, you know, just go out and vote every four years and everything will be fine. Uh, Jennifer, you mentioned the word neoliberalism, and this is a big word to say, and there's a lot to unpack in it. Um, 
would maybe both of you just share some of your understanding of what that means and, and why it's so important? In contemporary times, uh, it's the rise of the primacy of market markets, privatization, deregulation, um, financialization. Uh, so it's 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 the trend that occurred, you know, starting with uh, well, I suppose it, I don't know how far back we want to go, but let's just say the the, the last forty years. Uh, you know, it, it also looks and defines uh, human beings as primarily self-interested, uh, competitive, pits one against the other. Uh, with regards to government, which we just spoke of, it, it sees a, a minimal role of government and as stated, a uh, large role for, for markets in, in taking over many of the traditional um, roles that government have, has previously played. I, I think it's important to note that what we're doing in our film is marking a trend where neoliberalism shifted about 20 years ago into a uh, kind of neoliberalism with a smiling face. That's what the new corporation movement is all about. It's the same old neoliberalism, but now it's kind of shrouded in the garb of goodness of corporations being the good guys, saving the world. Um, and so I, I think what happened in the early 2000s is big business saw that their legitimacy was under attack. There was sort of whole anti-globalization movement and a lot of corporate uh, chiefs were saying, oh my God, you know, this isn't good. There were films like our film. You know, they were under attack. And, and rather than abandoning the play for power that they'd been involved with uh, in, since the 1980s in, in the sort of uh, nurturing of neoliberalism, rather than abandoning it, they doubled down on it, um, but they created a new story about it. And that is the reason we're taking over the world is because we're good guys and we can run it better than governments can. The way to make sense of it all is that they're saying, we're going to take charge of being good. We're going to take charge of what society needs. And we're going to basically take over that role from government. So it's like neoliberalism on steroids, but now with a smiling face. The reason we didn't want to overtly define it was because on the right, it, it's perceived as a, a term of disparagement that the left uses at times. And we felt we would be tipping our hand too early if we would, were to use it. Sorry if that was unclear. Uh, okay, we have a great question. It's so if privately owned corporations uh, as an institution are failing us, what should we fight for to replace them with? Yeah, so I mean, I think there are two ways to go and I think we need to go both ways. Um, one is we should look seriously at alternative ways of organizing production, worker-owned co-ops, things like that, which, uh, which many people are looking at. And I think that is a really Im important movement. Um, it's one that is, it's a hard fight. Um, I, there are a lot of kind of false ideas out there, like B Corps, for example, where a sort of privatized regime of, you know, checking off a few boxes, yeah, we're nice to our workers and, and all of that is going to solve these problems. But I think sort of radically rethinking um, the workplace as a place that is about creating good lives for workers, not just about creating profit and products, but that one of the products created in the workplace is a decent, secure, and fulfilling life for workers. That is a long-term project. So, and I think we have to, 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 to keep that fight going. At the same time, we have to fight for greater democratic control of the corporations as we have them now. And I don't think those fights are inconsistent in any way. I think they're both animated by the same values, which is how can we have a democratically accountable and democratically controlled uh, economy uh, that serves the public interest, that promotes equality and so on and so forth. So that is, is a project of both containing the uh, power of current corporations, but also trying to reimagine and move towards uh, a way of reorganizing production 
uh, that actually reflects values other uh, than self-interest. You know, to me, it's very much about right relationship. So, and again, it comes back to this idea of strengthening democracy. And so, you know, how do we make corporations subjects of governments? How do we rein in their outsized power? Of course, we're all looking very closely these days at the tech sector and antitrust and breaking them up potentially. And so it's sort of like, ha, ha, you know, if we look, if we visualize it as a, a scale, a literal scale, like what steps can we take so that we have a right relationship? What we have to do as, as citizens is continuously imagine that we can, we can do better. Uh, we, you know, it's like the US ideal of a more perfect union. Um, we, we know what values are important. We know that we need to take care of each other. We need to have a solidaristic society. We need to take care of the earth. Um, we need uh, to not subsume all of these values to simply individual greed and self-interest. I mean, that is, and I think the labor movement do the same thing, but with, with working people. It gives a collective voice to working people in the same way that a corporation gives a collective power to shareholders. And it's an absolutely essential um, balance, uh, not just in order to ensure that the membership of a union uh, is, is well served in, in terms of wages and benefits and occupational health and safety and all of that, um, but also for the, the larger um, uh, way of, of living democratically because that's what you do in a workplace that's unionized. Um, you are operating in a democratic institution and you're up against the power of another collective entity, namely the shareholders desire to improve their wealth um, through profit. And it also is, um, you know, like many other social organizations, like uh, environmental groups and whatnot, um, a union is an organization that can devote that collective power to larger issues of social justice, to larger issues of democracy, to larger issues of politics, um, that you can have a democratic process within the organization that then provides a collective voice outside and beyond the organization in the broader polity. Yeah, and you're completely speaking to the right audience here when you say that getting involved in your union is one way forward that is so crucial and it's a big part of the message that we uh, hope everyone takes away from this evening um, understanding too that unions are like uh, the testing grounds a place that we can learn the skills and ability to participate as active citizens right so we learn those things and we can take that um, into our communities beyond our unions as well. Um, Ferris, we have a lot of questions coming in, so I want to turn it over to you. Um, could you uh, pose another um, one of those viewer questions? We're going to go to David Choi now. Um, I was wondering what you feel the role of labor unions, uh, particularly public service unions like ours, um, what's our role in making change politically, and what can we do as individual union members to support that change? We are facing an onslaught of privatization. And I think that there is no better organized force than public sector unions to fight back against that. And when I say we're facing an onslaught of privatization, I think what we try to show in, in the film is that privatization is an inevitable logic that follows from um, the way corporations are organized. Um, corporations are organized, they have to grow, they have to profit and they have to find ways to do that. And the way that they have found lately as other kinds of markets dry up is to take over things like education, like water services. Those are like gold mines for them. Those are areas that they have been prohibited from entering by governments because those are areas that should not operate for profit. Um, utilities, uh, you know, you can, you can make a, a whole list, but all of those areas are inevitably, if corporations are doing the duty that they are legally required to do, they will have to prey on all of those areas. They will have to push to get into those areas. And that's what they're doing. And the only thing that's going to stop them is government saying no. 
And the only thing that's going to get governments to say no is citizens saying no and organized labor making an issue and getting the story out to the public as to why water or schools uh, or social services or uh, uh, social assistance or, or all these other areas should not be run on a for-profit basis. We just need to look to the south of us and, and see that, uh, you know, what's happening there, we don't want to happen in this country. And the only way it's not going to happen uh, to public health care, to education, to all these areas that are huge cash cows potentially for for-profit corporations, the only way we're going to protect those is by fighting for them. We can't take them for granted because they're in the sights of for-profit corporations, believe me, and not just Canadian companies, but uh, European companies that run water systems, um, uh, American companies that run education systems. They're looking at those sectors and saying, we want in and we want to profit from those sectors. So we have to fight back. I'll point, I think, to a silver lining at this moment in time, both with reference to the pandemic, as well as the torturous four years, some literally, others metaphorically, that we've experienced uh, with Donald Trump. And I think what that has laid bare in many instances is really the extraordinary dangers of privatization. You know, and if we do look at the pandemic in particular with regards to the United States and all of the failures of uh, delivery of ser services by the private sector. Uh, and then if we look internationally at the successes of governments, you know, particularly say in New Zealand, in terms of having this extraordinary and crucial role that only it can play. Uh, I think it's really <coughs> perhaps changed the conversation so there's more re receptivity to the value of keeping things in the private sector. Uh, okay, so uh, one question for both of you um, that uh, it would be great to, to hear more on that, you know, is, is touched on a little bit in the film is that, um, okay, so we know that corporations um, are pushing their agenda through politicians, which has led to decades of crushing uh, uh, changes in policies and regulations that have furthered the wealth gap. Um, and one thing that's the, about that is now we're seeing people um, both in the streets and taking up arms to defend that system that's crushing them. So we're seeing a rise in uh, people who are becoming militant and taking to the streets to defend uh, Donald Trump, who really embodies a lot of this, um, this change in the system. And, uh, and these are working class people who directly suffer from uh, the, these corporations and their, and their policies. So, you know, why, what do you attribute to that? Why do you think that's happening? Um, if you could just talk a little bit about that, thank you. You know, I think that, um... Of course, we have the rise of Fox News, right, right, you know, like so many different right wing, you know, even further to the right than Fox News media. And as many people point out, we, we really are living in parallel universes. And so, you know, it's, 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 I guess, you know, it's this, there's just this huge propaganda machine that is, um, convincing people to act, act against their own interests. And then I think there's also this underbelly of racism that informs it and entitlement. Uh, and that, you know, a lot of people who are um, gravitating towards the right and, and, and populism, like populism are, you know, feel entitled to more than what they have been given and they have been told to blame um, certain people in society. And, and not only that, um, I think there's a real reluctance to actually confront the colonial uh, roots of our societies and the, the, also the, the um, role that slavery has played. When you look across history, when people suffer hardship, when people are fearful, when people feel excluded from society, 
when people feel disempowered, um, they can uh, start to look for others to blame. Uh, and I think that that we see that in a lot of the the, the rise of, of xenophobia, xenophobia, the uh, exacerbation of, of racism, um, the just incredibly desperate acts like the storming of the Capitol that give people a sense of power when in fact they feel powerless, when they feel legitimately that the elites have have you know, screwed them over because the elites have. Because what we've seen over 40 years is a radical opening of the chasm of inequality, of the rich getting way richer, the, the middle class falling into poverty, uh, disappearing in some ways. The idea that you and your kids will have a secure union job that you'll be able to retire with benefits that you'll have health care that's all gone and that scares people and they should be scared because that sucks and to to live without uh security to live without uh proper health care to live without proper housing all of that is horrible and and you end up with any kind of social solidarity that might be created through common public services, like a really great healthcare program for everybody, great education for everybody, a sense that we're all actually included. Yeah, it's true, those people over there are a lot richer than we are and they live in nicer neighborhoods, but we have a roof over our head. Our kids go to the same schools as most of their kids do. We get the same doctors and the same health care. That's what provides, that's what creates, we get the same clean water, potable water. We get a decent um, uh, nutritional food. Um, we won't be left to fall through the cracks. That's what creates social solidarity. And that's what at least tamps down this incredible anger and desperation that I think we're, we're seeing explode in these situations. Um, you know, we have one commentator in the film saying uh, people get angry and, and about this inequality. And that may mean you know, wanting to build a wall on the southern border or uh, uh, activating for universal health care. You, you don't know which way it's going to go, but anger can go in both directions. And what, uh, what stops that from happening is, is actually having the infrastructure that allows for the kind of social solidarity that allows for the decent lives, the security, and most importantly, I think the hope for yourself and for future generations, for your kids that their lives will be better. You know, that, that's all, we, we're not that complicated as human beings. And the real shame of it all, and the argument I make in the book, is that when you ask, why has that infrastructure disappeared? Why don't we have it? Why has social solidarity been shattered? Why are people so angry and pointing the blame at, at others and becoming racist and xenophobic because of that anger, because of that fear, why? The reason why is because for 40 years, big business has been on a campaign and they haven't hidden it. It's right there in plain view. Just look at their campaign to privatize, look at their campaigns to deregulate, look at their campaigns to lower taxes. It's all there in plain view. They have been on a campaign to destroy the very thing, the social state, the social infrastructure that allows for social solidarity, that allows for us to live in a decent society. And that ensures that we don't have that kind of anger and that kind of fear, legitimate anger and legitimate fear, and that we can actually work together. You know, it's not kumbaya. It's not like you can create a society where you have radical inequality, radical insecurity, and then say, like Joe Biden did, and good for him. I mean, you know, hopefully he'll come through, but then say, we all have to work together. That doesn't work. It only works to say we all have to work together if it feels like everybody involved is making some sacrifice, paying taxes, for example, in order to ensure a good social infrastructure and ensuring that people don't fall through the cracks. That's what's needed. And that's what's been destroyed. And big business, the corporation, is largely responsible for the campaign to destroy it. One thing we haven't addressed that I think is an, another dimension that's important to state is the role of patriarchy. Uh, I don't want to be essentialist around gender, 
character. But without question, you know, the it is gendered. Uh, you know, there, there is a greater um, segment of the population that is leaning towards right wing populism who are male. Certainly, um, most if all contemporary strong men are men. Am I wrong there? Oh no, there'll be Lapine in France. Um, there may be occasionally uh, a woman um, taking on that role, but most of them are men. And what I find completely shocking is that the women who are involved just seem so, um, not everyone, and again, I don't want to be essentialist, but some who I have seen interviewed um, just seem so willing to overlook that part. You know, I mean, it's always just so incredulous to me how a, a woman can Again, it's voting against your own interests. And, and I guess, how does anyone vote against their own interests? But anyway, I just wanted to mention that I do believe that there's a component um, in the whole dynamic related to gender. I want to um, read out a question here, Ferris, if you don't mind, from uh, one of our anonymous attendees. Uh, this person wrote, do you feel part of the problem is that people vote for the wrong type of leader because we look for strength and someone who will protect us. Uh, maybe to change government, we need to change how people vote. What are your thoughts on that? I'm not a psychologist, but I think that there are really interesting questions about how people are drawn to, you know, as Jen described it, strong men. Um, and, you know, you don't have to do, dig too deep into Freud and psychoanalysis to, to think of the sort of the father that's going to take care of the patriarch, that's going to protect and, and solve your problems. And, um, and there may be some of that going on in this, but again, I think where it starts, and, and it is a bit of a dog chasing its tail, but where it starts is in people feeling legitimate anger and fear. Um, and, and the reasons why they feel that anger and fear are what we have to get at. And I say it's a dog chasing its tail because you know, how do we how do we get the kind of politics we need that will get us the kind of politics we need? How do we get to the point where people aren't searching for the strong leader, where people are searching for the kind of political leadership that is going to try to uh, bring us together in real tangible terms? You know, by by ensuring that those three sectors are in proper balance, the public. Uh, the private and the plural sectors, as Minsberg um, describes it. Uh, and, and that ensures that the, the uh, vast amount of wealth in society that is created by working people, not by bankers, not by CEOs, but by working people, that that wealth somehow uh, exists in some kind of uh, equality uh, that allows people to feel that they are in fact a part of society uh, rather than apart from it. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Caitlin and thanks so much for including me tonight. Um, I think one of the things that you mentioned kind of early on this evening was this idea that um, corporations have kind of made this campaign to undermine the idea that government can be a force for good in people's lives. And I think for myself, I spend a lot of time trying to think of ways to restore the public's faith in that idea that, that the government can do things that actually help people and make people's lives better. And so I'd be interested to hear what your um, suggestions are, are things that we can be doing to help change that narrative and to counter that idea that the government is the problem instead of, instead of corporate power being the problem. Sure, I mean, one of the things I usually start off those conversations with is just a, a transparent confession that yes, some governments are evil. You know, some governments do terrible things. You know, they're, they're and I think, you know, that's often overshot, you know, because because those kinds of governments that we all know about, well, no, I'm sure there's many things we don't know about, but you know what I'm trying to say here. It, you know, I think that overshadows sometimes um, helped 
without question by, you know, the corporate agenda of dissing government. But, you know, I, I always just say, look, democracy is always aspirational, but it is absolutely essential that we hold on to that aspiration and we continue to fight for it. Because government right now is really the only means through which we can um, regulate corporations and enact other collective policies as a as a unit right and so i just uh, i like to um just confess that it's all just aspirational and of course um there's some terrible governments but that doesn't mean that there aren't also uh, governments that are implementing policy for the common good and again I, going back to an earlier conversation related to the pandemic, I, I really do feel that that um, has given us the opportunity to see the essential role of government. Uh, the, other, uh, the other issue, of course, is climate catastrophe. And, you know, as um, Robert Weissman says in our film, you know, we, it would be stupid to look um, to corporations to, to solve climate catastrophe, we, you know, we can be doing that till the end of time. And, and really, we may just end time, right? And so uh, I think it's also very apparent to many people uh, that governments working collectively and as an international body or bodies um, to address the systemic problems that are, are leading to uh, a potentially unlivable world, um, I think a lot of people can really relate to that. Because what, what are, what are, you know, we're not going to do, we're not going to solve the climate crisis by in as individuals changing to um, energy efficient light bulbs, right? So how are we going to implement collective policy? And it's through uh, of bodies of government, right? So that's how I like to look at it. Um, this is from David. Uh, what is the most effective way uh, to convince or um, organize our coworkers in fighting against corporate power? So the first thing I would say is don't be beguiled by the myth that consumer power is real power. It's not. And so once you've sort of realized that, then the question is, so what do we need to do? How do we exercise our power as citizens? And that really, you know, gets back to a lot of what we've been talking about, that we need to think about acting collectively, that as individuals, there's not a whole lot that we can do. Um, you know, there's a whole lot that we can do when we're acting with others in trying to achieve ends, uh, struggling together in a union. Uh, against uh, privatizing schools or against other kinds of privatization, um, struggling together in environmental groups, uh, organizing protests, et cetera, and so forth, struggling together for workers' benefits, um, for decent pay, for uh, against disparities uh, based on race and gender in the workplace and so on and so forth. But the idea is struggling together. So, you know, I think the, the answer to the question, how do we organize for change um, has to start with, well, we need to organize, that, that would be number one. Uh, and number two is we need to exercise power uh, beyond simply our power as individual consumers. Um, beyond that, you know, again, I wish, I wish we had answers to all these questions. Uh, in our film, we're trying to sort of set the table for what questions need to be asked and try to sketch out some pathways for how to move forward. But, but really beyond that, uh, it's an ongoing process for, for all of us of, of education and action. Uh, well, real quick, I, I really just wanted to um, mention civil disobedience uh, and and also just point to how critical a moment in time it is. You know, we really, I don't think we can overstate that. We are, you know, we're, we're at the edge of the precipice. <laughs> the trajectory is not going in the right direction. And uh, it's, you know, we're past um, uh, incrementalism as a solution in most arenas. 
And, and so I just wanted to point to civil disobedience as another um, uh, way of organizing and creating change dramatically in some instances. Your film discusses how the power of workers can halt production when you show the fight for 15. At about an hour into the film, you mention um, the socialist city councillor in uh, Seattle who uh, has been propelled to power on an agenda of a $15 minimum wage. And uh, aside from that moment, you don't explore a whole lot, except again at the end of the film, very briefly, um, the power of strikes of a workers to withhold their labor. And then that would um, pressure corporations or governments. So I'd just like to ask you, um, was that an omission? And how do you feel about strikes in the struggle to rein in corporations? We had material at different times uh, that talked about this, that talked about the, uh, the fact that inequality has skyrocketed in, in the United States in perfect um, correlation with the destruction of the labor movement in the United States with right to work legislation in many states with, with unions uh, going down to like 6% union density in the private sector. We had all of that in the film and um, I'm not going to sort of get into all the, the politics and everything around things, but suffice to say, uh, we were always under pressure to make the film shorter, 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 and shorter. And in order to deal with that issue, this is a really bad excuse, but in order to deal with, with the labor movement, with strikes and all of that, you can't just kind of drop it in. And, and so it was a whole sort of segment and sequence um, that really, really unfortunately uh, ended, up, ended up dropping out, um, partly because of the kind of material we had that, you know, Shama's story in Seattle is super dramatic. We didn't have the, the right kind of material. Uh, you know, making a documentary on not a huge budget is, it's, it's tough, um, but, but I really do think that you've highlighted uh, an issue. So uh, in the sequel to the sequel, uh, in another 10 years, <laughs> <laughs> when we spend a whole uh, sort of segment of the film talking about how the labor movement saved society from, uh, from going in an undemocratic direction, uh, and that becomes the main protagonist of our next film, uh, we'll be sure to, uh, to include all of that. And one thing I just wanted to add to, add to was, you know, because sadly, um, as we know, uh, membership in, in unions has, has declined so much in, in recent decades, certainly uh, a large part because of the corporate assault on unions, uh, which we used to have in our film. And so for me, I think in some instances, right now until we can build up labor membership again union membership again it seems to me that some of the strikes that have been the, certainly the largest um, and the most effective like some of the women's strikes uh, against sexual violence around the world which have been huge where you know and, and it's not based on membership in a union it's based on membership in some form of of oppression or labor exploitation. So I, I think that's really an interesting direction to, um, to, to consider. And, and like everything uh, right now related to organizing, uh, thinking outside of the box and, and sort of reframing it and trying to come at these things from different angles. You know, I think that's where we might um, hit on some uh, really effective strategies. And you know what? I just have to say, I have to go and I will tell you why, because um, it's very apropos uh, when I originally booked this, but I've been trying to get into a housing co-op, nonprofit housing in Vancouver for a year and a half. And uh, I actually have an interview that was scheduled right at seven o'clock uh, and it's crossed my fingers. The rents in Vancouver are through the roof. Uh, so I have to go to try and get into not-for-profit housing, but I want to say, first of all, Please, anyone that wants to go have a deeper dive. It's a brilliant book, Joel's book, The New Corporation, How Good Corporations Are Bad for Democracy. And, and thank you so much. This was a really um, 
inspirational uh, conversation and, and I, I really wish everybody so much, uh, so many good wishes for the work you're doing and, and, I, and we're there in solidarity with you. Thank you, Jen, for coming. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, uh, hope, solidarity, peace for everybody. And some love too, could use it. Joel, thanks so much. We really appreciate you doing this. It was a pleasure to have you join us. Thank you. And thank you for making, uh, writing your book and making that important film. All right, take care, everybody. It was the third of June, another sleep at Dusty Dells.